Shalom and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be sharing the remarkable historical story of the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary and how they birthed a movement in Germany that brought repentance and reconciliation between Christians and the Jewish people after the Holocaust. Warm welcome to the programme and uh, my two special guests today all the way from, from Hertfordshire. Uh, they are Sister Glory and uh, Sister Telkia of the Evangelical Sisterhoods of, of Mary. So a uh, warm welcome to you both. It's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, both on the program. And uh, you showed me wonderful hospitality uh, back in September of 2022 um, at your house where you organized a, a monthly meeting for Israel. So it's now my turn to return the hospitality and, and the favor. So thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, and I'll, I'll start off with, with you, um, Sister Thelkia. You Tekla, sorry, Tekla. You're from um, Germany, but can you share with our viewers how you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was um, a children's nurse, and in my holidays, uh, a colleague took me to East Germany. Um, I had just lost my brother, and I was very depressed, and uh, her sister was a, a committed Christian, and she prayed with me, and she said, only Jesus can comfort you. And, uh, and she prayed with me. And then there was an evening, an evangelical um, um, evening, and, uh, and I heard this message and I was deeply touched. And then we sang a song, a German hymn, and it said, oh, that I loved so late. And that went into my heart because I had the experience at my confirmation, but then in my studies and so uh, I got a little bit lost. But the Lord had found me, found me again. And, uh, and then she gave me that wonderful book, this lady in East Germany, it was still communistic, uh, and she gave me realities of faith. And I read that through the whole night and I thought I must go there. Uh, and see if that really is true, all these miracles God did and answers to prayer. And uh, I went and I found it was all true. And then I stayed there for a while f as a helper and uh, came for retreats. And so the Lord spoke to me very clearly one day, this is your home. And, uh, and I thought, the, the bird has found its nest. And I had to prove myself, of course, and uh, our founders also prayed about it and, um, and thought it was a calling. It needs a calling from the Lord. And, it, and it's now nearly 50 years and I'm still very happy and we don't look back. <laughs> amazing, amazing, incredible. And uh, Sister Glory, do, do you want to share your story of, of how you came yes. to faith in the Lord yes, Jesus Christ? Thank you, and Simon. also, you know, how you got involved with the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary? Yes. Um, well, I was brought up in a, in a Christian home, but um, I had to find that own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that came really um, partly through a visit to Germany that I made after I left school. And um, I, looking back, I, I feel it was the Lord's uh, guidance that I went to work in a hospital in Hamburg and learned to speak German. And when I was there, I really had experience of, of the Lord. And coming back again to England, I worked actually in a factory in York and um, a lady who was a missionary there she um, prayed for me quite a lot and with her I gave my life to Jesus nice. and that was such a special um, time for me. I had the privilege of uh, attending St Cuthbert's Church with David Watson and learning more about the Lord and um, then later um, sisters actually from Radlett where we are now they visited York and um, I heard them sharing and I was really drawn um, and they, they, they asked me um, if I'd like to visit Radlett and then Germany and um, that was when the Lord called me yes excellent uh, and um, can you share with us um, sister 
Telka, um, I've certainly what is the evangelical sisterhood of, of Mary? Tell us about the, the ministry. I mean, we will unpack the, the incredible history and the story behind it, but, but for our viewers, share with us uh, uh, who you both are. Yeah, first of all, we are an international and interdenominational uh, community, sisterhood, and our main, um, how can I say, um, our main, uh, what, we, what we are there for is to love Jesus mm. and to uh, work for him um, and prayer, of course, uh, time with him first, uh, intercessory prayer, and also uh, we work for him. Uh, Mother Basilea uh, wrote uh, quite a few books, I think, in, in German, uh, about a hundred, and we have about 60 uh, in, in English and many in other um, languages. And so people can order them and we send them uh, the books or literature or whatever, uh, c CDs and DVDs we have uh, all from our own sisterhood. And um, our mother house is in Germany, and um, we have sisters of 19 different nationalities, and that makes our sisterhood and our community very rich because they all bring their beauty in there. And they're very happy. I have just been there uh, three weeks, and um, it's it's just we get lifted up there again and, and recharged when we go to the mother house in Germany. And to say anything else, we are doing, Sister Gloria, intercessory prayer, uh, and especially our main um, focus is Israel and the Jewish people. Amazing. And this is what we do in all the branches, and especially in Germany. Which, which is one form which we hear about now. So, yeah. uh, uh, Sister uh, uh, Gloria, I mean, um, the, the founder, uh, Mother Basilia um, Schillick, has got an incredible story, hasn't she? I mean, born in, uh, according to my notes here, she was born in 1904 as um, Clara Schillick, grew up in a very, very academic family, mm -hmm. uh, and that she founded your order. So share with us um, her amazing story, really. I mean, well, there's a picture of her there on, on screen. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, she, it is really amazing because um, from uh, her first encounter with the Lord Jesus when she was about 18, um, she really wanted to follow him wholeheartedly. And in her life story, Foretaste of Heaven, she describes very honestly the struggles that she had um, and what um, to follow him in, in true discipleship. And she, um, first there was the way to be, which she felt was more legalistic and another way was more free. And she found the way in the love for Jesus, that was the answer to find that way. And, um, very soon after the sisterhood began, she felt this call from the Lord to um, spend more time in prayer and seclusion. And uh, this was very difficult. She was a very um, kind of person that liked to socialize. So this was really a big sacrifice. But the Lord uh, used that so wonderfully to speak to her and most of our ministries that we have now were born during this time when she withdrew with him yeah. and spent time, yes. Uh, and um, Sister Telka, uh, just to share with us um, something uh, about her background, because I mean, she grew up in, obviously before the First World War, so she would have been very, very young when the First World War yeah. occurred, uh, and then living through that, uh, real poverty and struggle in Germany after yeah. the Second World War, uh, and then to be growing up in the 30s. And uh, it, it says here, according to the notes that I did, so she, um, she attained a doctorate in psychology, 
from the University of Hamburg, mm -hmm. where she studied under Jewish professors uh, William uh, Stern in psychology and Ernest Kashir, a uh, philosophy, and also Edwin Panofsky, a history of art, until they were forced to leave when the, when the, uh, the Nazis took power in 1933. Mm -hmm. Can you share what probably influence that had of having Jewish university professors and the, the imprint that they made on her early life, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being a student at university in Germany in the late 1920s, early 30s. Yes, that's very interesting, actually. I didn't know all these names, but uh, uh, she sometimes shared about her professors, that they were Jewish. And I think that was something in her that she, even in, in the war where Hitler was uh, saying, uh, I mean, he, he wanted to be the messiah of Germany, and um, that she, what was actually forbidden, uh, talked about the Old Testament. And, um, and she, she, yeah, she just talked about the Jewish people, uh, Israel, uh, that uh, God, God's people. And um, so that was, and she was twice uh, interrogated to the police, from the police, and uh, they checked her and they asked her and, and she gave them a real good answer um, that Jesus is the Messiah. And so um, I, she, should, she could have been in prison, but they let her go twice. Amazing. So that is a, a miracle. Uh, and also, um, Sister Glory, um, Mother uh, Basilia, was able to kind of defy the Nazis, wasn't she? I mean, mm. uh, this, this is quite extraordinary. So back when the, the Nazis came to power in Germany in 1933, uh, she was the national German president of the Women's Wing of the uh, Christian Student Movement from 1933 to 1935. She rejected the anti-Semitic and racist Aryan policy mm -hmm. um, of the Nazis that would exclude Jewish people from organizations, professions, and public office, and she refused. Mm -hmm. Share with us what kind of character she would have needed to actually then defy the Nazis uh, and to defy Nazi racist, anti-Semitic policy in the 1930s when the rest of Germany was falling into line with the Nazis and what Hitler was doing. Yes, well, in, in one of her other books, Patmos, bo um, when the heavens opened, she shares that uh, testimony herself, that um, she was filled with such an assurance of the coming kingdom of God that she said all her fear just left her and she just proclaimed this uh, in front of the Nazis and um, they they were just uh, they let her go they they just didn't have anything to say i mean it was the lord really uh, giving a miracle but i think i think she she was uh, so uh, inwardly convinced and the lord um, just gave her that strength and that courage that um, that she could live that out Sister Gloria, it takes someone really special, doesn't it, to actually stand up and defy the Nazis, mm -hmm. despite the fact that she was interrogated twice by the Gestapo, mm. and she continued to proclaim God's purposes and love for the Jewish people mm. at a time when the Third Reich policy was uh, the final solution to mm. eliminate the entire Jewish race. Mm. What courage and convictions did she have to actually do that in Nazi Germany during the Second World War? Mm. Well. We can only say the Lord just uh, really gave her, gave her that, uh, uh, called her to, to do that, and she was obedient to him. Um, he showed her very clearly that they were his people and um, gave her the courage to, to speak out for him, for them, yes. And um, Sister uh, Thelka, do you think that this is, that, that not only did God preserve preserve her, but because of the courage that she showed in the 1930s and then during the Second World War under the Third Reich of speaking up for the Jewish people, that, that God blessed her with this uh, incredible global worldwide ministry afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Well, first of all, uh, during the um, Second World War, she uh, traveled a lot through whole Germany and uh, even to the east. Um, and um, I think she was really always on the move and she was not very well and it was bitter cold and she did all this for the Lord and she spoke in many churches, she spoke to fellowships and, and uh, people really um, made shorthand of her, her talks and later on that's how the literature came about because they were all uh, shorthand and um, yeah, and I mean, she, the sisterhood was already born in 47, um, the sisterhood started. And um, Mother Maturia actually led the sisterhood while Mother Basilea was traveling and uh, ministering to the people and talked about uh, God's people and, uh, and why we have to uh, love Israel and love the Jewish people. Uh, she was just just full, full, and I think the, these professors have strengthened her or gave her that, um, helped her. Um, I mean, the Lord really uh, led her to do that. Um, and she came home uh, then to the sisters. We were not there at that time. <laughs> we came later and um, and she shared with the sisters, and, and so the sisters learned through her um, about her love for Israel and her love for the Jewish people. And I mean, it, it was a very, very uh, sad um, time when uh, the Jewish people all disappeared. And even in Darmstadt, and, uh, but still, you know, uh, the churches were blind. They didn't, they didn't say anything, they didn't do anything. This might, I might be a little bit ahead of you, but uh, when the Kristallnacht was, um, if the church bells would have rung all the churches in Darmstadt, I think there could have been a change that the Jewish people would have been more safe and not all transported into the dead camps. Um, so Mother Basilea, she uh, tried afterwards to help the Jewish people who either came back, I don't know if I can share that now. Of Ms. Yeah, please do, please do. Um, uh, the sisters, young sisters at that time, they were probably 20, 30 sisters. Um, they went to um, a camp in Darmstadt where uh, Jewish people came back into because they lost their houses. Darmstadt was completely bombed, burned out. And so they went there to help. And, um, and one day uh, we had a dear, dear gentleman coming to us. Uh, his sister brought him and he uh, was completely paralyzed through what the Nazis did to him. Experiments, uh, mm. experiment. Experiment, mm. thank you, yeah. And um, so the sisters said they would li like to take him into uh, our little nursing home at that time. And uh, he was uh, looked after, he, he was happy there. He could speak, but he couldn't move. And, uh, and, and yeah, the wonderful thing was, we don't know exactly when it was, we were, were talking this morning about it, but he saw, he told the sisters, he saw suddenly in his deep, deep anguish, a beautiful piece of land. And when he came into our little land of Canaan, he said, that's what I saw. And uh, so uh, at the end of his life, he gave his life to the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. 
So that was a wonderful story. And, and until now, uh, the sisters in Darmstadt and all our branches uh, try to meet uh, Holocaust survivors and to help them, to listen to them and uh, try to, we can't, we can't make, make it different, you know, what the Nazis have done, it, it's so terrible that, um, but what we can do, we can love them and comfort them in the anguish and uh, sorrow. And we have heard many, many um, testimonies of Holocaust survivors. And I can only say they share their um, anguish. They, they share everything uh, very, very deep. But I have never heard a word of hatred. And that is so amazing. Yeah, I, I can testify to that. Yes. Yeah. Mm, when, yeah. I, when I've interviewed Holocaust survivors, um, there it, it, it seems to be a love and a joy and a, a passion for life they have yeah. that, that other people don't yes. have, and they've yeah. got this amazing sense of joy, which which is, which is incredible. And of yeah. course, with uh, with uh, Mother uh, Basilia, we we have to understand that she is one of those yeah. heroes of the Second World War. Yeah. We can put her in the same uh, bracket as. Um, as Cory Ten Boon, or yeah. um, she, they knew each other. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I gather they probably would do. That probably would do. So let's have a look at this extract from this uh, documentary, uh, as entitled uh, "Through uh, Jerusalem." This is a two-part ex uh, extract of this documentary, produced by the Sisterhood, of the Evangelical Sisterhood of Mary. The words uttered by Jesus during this battle reveal to us his heart, not words of mistrust and rebellion against God, but deeply moving words of trust came from Jesus' lips in response to all the suffering that God let him undergo. Free for God and of your own free will, binding yourself to the loving heart of God and to His will, you will find the deepest fulfillment to your life. Now Jesus, bound in chains, is entreating you. And I think all of us need to do a bit more research on uh, Mother Priscilla. Uh, her story is remarkable, uh, and she is definitely one of those uh, heroines of the Second World War, uh, mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. Um, Sister Gloria, you, you've met her, so can you just share with us uh, what her character is like and, the, and her personality, and, and how much of a, a personal inspiration that she's been in your life? Yes. Well... Uh, greatly, she was really a, a spiritual mother for us. She cared for us, prayed for us, loved us, helped us through um, difficult times, helped us to overcome our sins and problems. And um, perhaps just because we are sharing about the Jewish people, um, that was a very deep impression on me, the way that she um, how deeply she repented mm. for the Holocaust and, and um, I had never really s met with such, um, such a depth of her, her sorrow and her longing to, wherever she could, to love the Jewish people and she prayed for um, I don't know if you if you um, read that, but she was um, she prayed for an opportunity to visit Israel, um, and it wasn't for Germans. It was very difficult at that time. They didn't um, we didn't want to uh, invite them, and um, she was given a visa for going to Israel, and um, the Lord really made a way for that for that and for us to have a house there in Israel and um, for 50 years uh, sisters lived there 
and cared for Holocaust survivors, yes, in, in um, Jerusalem. Amazing. Yeah. So can, can, can you share with us, um, Sister Thelkia, uh, just the, how the Lord challenged her with, with such a, a profound um, question back in the summer of 1954, when she was praying in the Lord's presence and the Lord asked her a question, what about Israel? Uh, <laughs> uh, and share how then th this transformed the, the ministry that just had a, uh, just developed an incredible passion and love for Israel and the Jewish people to rewrite the wrongs of the Nazi era in the 1930s and the 1940s and, and to show that incredible Christian love towards yeah. the Jewish people. She once said to us, or often said to us, I never wanted to say no to the Lord. And when he told her to go to Israel, and she had no idea how she can go to Israel, and, and suddenly there came a, an invitation from, is, from Israel, and, and then the Lord even gave her the money to fly, and that mm. was a confirmation. Mm. And she was not even well, but when she was flying, she suddenly had new strength, and she was fine. And, and um, um, she went to different um, uh, people, uh, someone must have told her, and she asked for forgiveness. She was even invited, uh, in synagogues to speak. I was I'm not sure if that was the first time or she went again. Um, she was invited again and uh, she spoke here and there and she, she really repented with all her heart about the German and the Nazis um, and the Holocaust. And, um, and people responded. They really do, uh, did respond, and I think it was the uh, deputy mayor who said there is a new uh, sign coming from Germany, mm -hmm. and that was through Mother Basilea. And um, yeah, and then she she uh, said she would send two sisters into an, um, a hospital or a home where Holocaust survivors are living and to help voluntarily. They didn't get any money. They lived in a little, it was in Haifa, in a little um, flat together and uh, just cared. But then, I think two, two years later, um, they got that house with Abraham in the old city. And, um, and the sisters there, Sister Chloe shared it already, um, cared for Holocaust survivors there. And it was wonderful how uh, these dear, dear people, they couldn't speak, a, uh, and they some word German, uh, couldn't speak a word of German anymore, what is understandable. And, and suddenly they started again to speak German with the sisters. They just felt that love from the sisters and they um, cooked kosher and uh, they went, they had a, a little bus and went to the holy places, uh, the Jewish holy places. So there was a wonderful um, contact uh, with the Jewish community in, in Israel. But that house had to be closed uh, because it was now the Holocaust survivors are getting older and they needed a little bit more comfort and that house was old so um, and the sister thought now maybe it's it's our ministry in Israel is finished and but the solicitor said no 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 you have to stay here you can't go away so they um, he, I, he wanted to find another house and he did and it's now a beautiful home for the sisters uh, in, uh, in Kerim. And uh, this house, uh, they, they hope to get another building where they can take in Holocaust survivors, but at the moment it's not possible. And, but people, they visit people and uh, people can come to visit them and they do a lot with the Holocaust survivors uh, still and visit them at home and help them. That's amazing, isn't it? What, yeah. what an incredible legacy. Uh, uh, and Sister Gloria, if we, if we 
if we just run the clock back and just imagine what Germany would have been like uh, in 1954. This is only nine years after the end of World War II. Mm. Um, Germany is completely uh, devastating, of course, bombed by the Allies. Mm. Uh, and then we saw the Marshall Aid plan kick in to rebuild uh, Germany, particularly uh, West Germany, uh, because East Germany was under control mm. of, mm. The, uh, of, this, of the Soviets. Mm. Uh, and then to think that out of all that kind of misery uh, and, and when Germans are trying to rebuild their lives after Second World War, rebuild their businesses in their homes and, and the nation, um, that uh, Mother uh, Basilica had a, a tremendous heart then for uh, rep a repentance movement mm. and reconciliation with the Jewish mm. community. Um, share with us how much that vision kind of transformed German-Israeli mm. relations because Israel uh, made the, the, the brave decision by David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister in 52, to mm. establish full diplomatic relations with West Germany. How much do you think that um, Mother Basilica played a role with that, with the, the, the movement that she birthed of, of mm. repentance and reconciliation with the Jewish people mm. after the Holocaust? Well, what we have heard, it, it was a very significant part that it played. And um, she, she felt, Mother Basilea felt led to write this plays which um, about Israel, about God's plan with Israel. And these were actually shown at the German um, uh, Kirchentag, that's like a, 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 a day of German churches coming together. And um, there were huge numbers, even 300,000 people. And the sisters were asked to perform these plays even three times, wasn't it? Or, yeah, or more a day. A yeah. day. Um, and people were going out, many people were going out weeping uh, because they were realizing what had happened during the Holocaust. And many, many had not realized what exactly was going on. Mm. And uh, so, We've heard that th that from that um, there was really a change. Um, others, others also in Germany have uh, repented. There are other movements, aren't there? Yeah, um, Jobst, yeah. Jobst Bittner and Harald Eckert and different um, other. Mm, yeah. Uh, and Sister uh, Telkia, can you also I explain the kind of magnitude? Because when we're looking at uh, Germany, Nazi Germany of the 1930s and 40s, responsible for the death of over uh, 6 million Jewish people on industrial scale with, uh, with the Nazi death camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau and, um, uh, and others, and, uh, and, and how probably the German people and the probably German government wanted to forget what happened a decade earlier. So just show with us how important it was that she brought uh, Christian awareness of the need for repentance uh, to the Jewish people for the crimes committed by the Nazi regime, uh, but also uh, a need for reconciliation uh, and showing Jewish people that Christian love uh, and, and writing a new chapter in Christian uh, Jewish relations as well as in German Jewish relations. Well, I, I, that play uh, was played in many German uh, uh, cities and even in Switzerland and in Austria. And her book, uh, Israel, My Chosen People, mm. what you have and showed, um, that also uh, made a big, big um, change in, in, in Germany. Unfortunately, it's still um, a lot of anti-Semitism and, uh, and also uh, replacement theology in, in Germany. And uh, there were also, again, uh, anti-Semitic attacks on uh, people. And um, Mother Basilea, she tried very hard, and the sisters with her, and, um, and of course, uh, very important is uh, prayer, intercessory prayer. And every Friday evening, uh, first of all, the sisters um, uh, stood uh, a long time, many years, just stood for their breakfast and uh, had water and bread. And uh, later on, when we got sisters from America and other countries, uh, it got a little bit, we couldn't do that anymore. 
and uh, <clears throat> but also on Friday evening um, we have a prayer time for Israel and the Jewish people in Germany and all over the world against anti-Semitism and uh, replacement and really praying for Israel and uh, and when people come to us they invited to join us in these prayers and we have um, uh, retreats and groups are coming to, to little Canaan in Germany. Um, there are constantly um, people are coming from all over the world and, uh, and in, from Germany especially and they had just a very very big uh, youth group uh, for three days and there were about 40 I think 40 people no more I don't know exactly but a lot of young people and of course they hear it and young people now and that is a comfort to me uh, they search and they want to know what have their fathers done and their, their um, grandfathers mm -hmm. done and they repent young people right. repent and go to Auschwitz and mm -hmm. go to Israel and uh, and try to really um, make an amend so let's have a look now at this uh, very uh, powerful uh, CBN uh, news report um, sharing uh, tear-stained letters from those uh, Jewish people who went through the horrors of the Holocaust over 80 years ago. My dear Rosie, I am happy that you received our greetings. What are you up to, my darling? Be well. Many kisses from your mother. In every letter at the beginning and at the end, she wrote, make sure to take care of your health. That's the final letter Rosie Yoshkovitz received from her mother, Berta. Each story is unique. In those online exhibitions, we are telling stories first to commemorate the victims, to give them back their names, the human dignity. Yona Kobo oversees the new exhibit Last Letters from the Holocaust, 1943. The letters were chosen because they are very intimate, very personal, very unique because each handwriting is different from one person to the other. You can find stains of tears of those who wrote the letters and tears of those who received the letter. When you read these letters from mothers, fathers, children, uh, what does that do to your heart? Sometimes it's tearing me apart. Sometimes I'm crying. How were they delivered? Was there a post? There was no postal service in the that? post service worked the entire war, even in the camps. Censorship. Sometimes not. But I think they censored themselves. Kobo gave us an extremely rare look at Yad Vashem's vast archives, where I saw some of the actual letters. What does this say? That was written by a child. She was almost 12 years old. Her name was Regina Folkenflik, and she was living at East Poland. She was hidden at a Christian family. Her parents thought that was the best way to save her, by putting her in a good family. But the child was shot. The rest of the family survived. And her brother, uh, now 84 years old, donated the letter to Yad Vashem. It's in Polish, and she's writing, Dear mother and father and dear Dolik, her brother, be well. Mommy, don't be upset. Please forgive me, Mommy, for writing so little. And here's another one? That is another one, written by a young woman, 19 years old, Rosette Bomblat. She was active in a group of underground movement in Paris. She helped saving other Jewish children. Her family was hidden in a village not far away from Paris. And Rosette is writing here in French. I'm only living for the day that we will be together again. All the family, except of Rosette and her oldest sister Sarah, survived and emigrated to Israel. She didn't? She didn't. She was transferred to Auschwitz. She was murdered in the camp. What about your family? My mother was born in Germany, mm -hmm. and she has been through a ghetto, a labor camp, and a very, very long death march. She marched 800 kilometers by foot. My father survived Auschwitz, and they met after the war was over. And when I 
was older, like 35 years old, my father remembered to tell me his secret. He was a widow when he met my mom. He lost his first wife and baby daughter in Belzitz. I just recently found the name of his daughter. This online exhibit is just one of many at Yad Vashem, the main collection of Holocaust documentation in the world. So one of the main missions of Yad Vashem is to collect into one place all the documents, all the evidence about the fate of Jews during the Holocaust. It was the first intention of Holocaust survivors the first day after the war was ended. Dr. Heim Gertner is director of the archives. We understood that the Nazis not only planned to murder the Jews, but also understood or wanted to annihilate, to erase our ability to know who were they and what happened to them. Erase their memory. So this is why Yad Vashem decided as one of its uh, most important uh, missions to collect all those pieces of huge puzzle of uh, our uh, joint history into one place. The more than 200 million pages of documentation includes testimony, survivors' stories, photos, and other personal items. We launched seven years ago a national campaign. We call it Gathering the Fragments. We met until now close to 11,000 people who donated to us during the last seven years more than 124,000 items and collections. And are there many survivors living today that have seen this, been here, and, and experienced this? Yes, uh, Holocaust survivors do see Yad Vashem as the home of their items, and they say here it will be kept forever. Mm. Here preserve it. And I may tell you the story, for example, of this uh, sweater over here yes. that was donated to us on the first day of this campaign, seven years ago, by a lady from Tel Aviv. Uh, it was belonged to her sister. So uh, for her, it took a lot of time to decide to uh, separate with that. The name Yad Vashem comes from the Bible. It means a memorial and a name. Yad Vashem during the last uh, two decades and more is struggling to tell the story of individuals in the Holocaust. They were human beings that used to live in Europe and elsewhere, and they had lives, they had kids, they had dreams, and it tells us also something about their ability to uh, survive during those years in those inability times. How important is it to have all this online? Around a million visitors are coming to Yad Vashem every year. Almost 10,000 of them are visiting our reading room every year. But last year, more than 19 million people all over the world, Jews and non-Jews, used our databases online. Because you're around us and have explored this and researched it, do you become jaded at all? I mean, it has to affect your heart. I am a son of a Holocaust survivor myself. I can ask you that. I think that as an educator, our mission here to educate the next generation is what gives us the strength to think ahead what to do with that story for generations to come. Scott Ross for CBN at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. And uh, if you've never had the chance to uh, visit uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust uh, Museum in Jerusalem, then, then it's an absolute must. And we also have to point out a, a wonderful fact that Mother Brasilia and uh, the Evangelical uh, Sisterhood of Mary played a major role for Holocaust survivors in the 1960s with the, uh, the Holocaust trials that took place in Germany uh, by providing them with comfort and going in, even going into the courtrooms with them to give them that moral support and, and comfort. And that's mm -hmm. a, a wonderful demonstration of love to our, brother, uh, our Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, Sister Glory, can you share with us um, what's your radlet? Uh, branch is doing because you're, you're part of the UK branch. You've got, I think, is it 220, uh, 220 branches around the world? Um, 10. 10. 10. 10. So yeah. can you share with us what, what you're doing in the, in the United Kingdom? Yes. Well, concerning the Jewish people, um, we, we both uh, felt really the Lord put on our hearts in, um, I think, 1999, when um, Sister Pista, one of our older sisters, she came and spoke um, in the Methodist Central Hall, and um, that was like a bit of a catalyst, and uh, we started um, praying uh, for um, contacts with Jewish people, because uh, Radlet, where we live, is 30% Jewish, and many Jewish people are moving out from London, from Golders Green and um, from Finchley to live there. And um, 
we have to say really that it's been God's work from the beginning because he's put people across our path and led us in different ways um, over the years, uh, which has just been amazing. And um, maybe just one particular time um, we were led in 2014, we, we have an Israel afternoon every year and we had the privilege of Simon speaking last year, uh, this year, this year uh, in September. And um, in 2014, um, Werner Ode, a son of Anati, came and that was the first time we um, had been to a synagogue previously and um, one of the uh, gentlemen there expressed interest and they um, said, can we come to that afternoon? And we said, you're most welcome. And so that was the first time we invited Jewish friends to these afternoons. And we were quite overwhelmed that there were about 120 people. We had to find seats and uh, even outside for them. And um, that was a very powerful testimony from Verda Oda, which really touched their hearts deeply. And to know that so many, um, that Christians love them. They, quite a few said that meant so much that they knew that, mm. yes. Yeah. And um, Sister um, the Theoka, isn't it incredible that you were actually involved in uh, what was known as repenting on behalf of the uh, British nation for the for British the England, mandate in, uh, in and in Germany? Sister Glory. Yeah, yeah, but you both participated in, in that event in Haifa um, a couple of years ago, um, where by the nation of, uh, you were repenting on behalf of the nation of Britain for the British mandate mm. uh, and what happened there. And, and just show us the, the reaction to the Jewish people to your ministry, because having spoken at your, your wonderful event and to see um, a few Jewish people there, especially on a Saturday afternoon, w mm. was quite something. So share with us how mm. you are reaching out to the local Jewish community. Mm. Yeah, well, I think um, if I could just say very briefly that um, the example of, of Mother Basilia and, and our older sisters really deeply impacted sisters who, like myself from um, Britain, um, to really look into our nation's um, uh, relationship with Israel and much of the guilt that has been over the years, over 2000 years. And I come from the north and one particular thing is in my heart is in, uh, in York, there was a massacre there and um, 150 Jewish people died in Clifford's Tower in 1190. And just realizing some of these things and then coming to Radlett, um, a few doors away from us, a lady, Jewish lady we came to know, and she was one of the first families, her family, to live in York after this massacre. And just to meet her and to be able to say how sorry we were on behalf of um, the church and everything that happened at that time. And uh, we had uh, still a very close friendship with her. Um, and this has happened on several occasions and and such a great, uh, you've already mentioned the British mandate and um, what a privilege to stand at the dock of tears and to say how sorry we were that his own people who survived the camps trekked the whole way over the mountains to get into those very uh, dilapidated boats and then uh, to be turned away from the shores of their own nation. and. That is deeply on our hearts and um, yeah, mm, we've okay. been privileged to make contact with many of those who suffered during that time and that, that's been a great privilege. Um, and, and how important is it that we, we make uh, that Christians understand their Bible, understand what the Bible says about Israel and the Jewish people to mm. counter church replacement theology and also what we're seeing today sadly mm. is a, a tsunami of anti-semitism mm. around the world today mm. yeah yeah what can we do we can only pray and uh, intercede and ask god to i mean we are so upset that all the synagogues need guards 
uh, when they have their meetings. And the churches have open doors. We don't need that. And uh, because of Radlet, many, many Holocaust survivors and many, many Jewish people, we see them going into the synagogues and we are invited into the synagogue sometimes for special occasions and, um, and see this um, man watching and they know us now, they, they smile when we come. Um, but uh, it is more and more that uh, people in Radlet, when they see us, uh, they greet us, uh, they want to hear how we are, and we invite Holocaust survivors into our house. And any t when I meet um, another Holocaust survivor or a Jewish person, I always need to say something because it is just uh, when they share their stories and they have lost maybe a relative or parents even, I have to say, I'm so sorry. Mm. And um, they have to, to uh, sense that I mean it. And sometimes they can't say straight away, but uh, that's okay, you have been so small in, in that time. And, but uh, it's still my German people who have done these atrocities to the Jewish people. So uh, I don't know about my father even and my uncles. I have never asked them. But um, so I, I, this, is, this is something in my heart. I just must, must uh, reach out to them and say, I'm so sorry. And one gentleman ex especially, he couldn't say anything. And, um, and then we, his wife invited us for the synagogue and uh, we went for the Holocaust Memorial evening and he did not uh, respond. But um, uh, after three years, he suddenly said, come back next year. So suddenly he, he has experienced that uh, we mean it. And uh, he, he was our best friend afterwards. Amazing. Can I, can I just share just very briefly, just before we kind of close, that, that you both are an inspiration and, and you really set the example of Christian love to Israel and the Jewish mm -hmm. people and the way that you reach out to the, the local Jewish community, uh, the way that you open your homes to the Jewish people and the Holocaust survivors, that you, you're both doing incredible work and you're involved in incredible ministry with an incredible legacy and it's just been a pleasure to to host you both today so thank you for what you are doing because you are really uh, showing the jewish people that god's people the christians do love them they do yeah. we do care for them mm. and we do stand with them particularly in this time of rising anti-semitism mm. and, and, and jew hatred and when israel is vilified uh, we need to show and tell our Jewish friends that they're not alone, that we love them. Yeah. And, and you two are in a classic example of doing that in a practical love, very much in the vision of a mother Brasilia. So thank you so much for being my guest on the Middle East Port today. Oh, thank you for having us, Simon. Yeah. It's been yeah. a pleasure. Privilege to share. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching uh, today's uh, Middle East Report. Uh, for those of you who are interested to know a little bit more, there is uh, this book uh, called Israel, My Chosen People by Mother Basilica. Uh, we have it up on screen there. And um, to tell the incredible story of the uh, evangelical sisterhoods of Mary, how it began uh, and how Israel is a central part of their ministry. So please uh, pray for our, our two sisters here in the ministry that they do in, in showing love and support for the Jewish people and we need to follow their example by showing that practical love and support to the Jewish community in the UK and also for Israel to speak up against Jew hatred and to defend the only Jewish state in the world that is the modern state of Israel and to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report. <laughs>